Victor Meldrew confronts the insanities of life with one foot in the grave in this BBC book. Two videos of the award-winning series are also available. Salt! Oh, no, they haven't. Do you have any idea of how many highly skilled man-hours over a three-day period have gone into producing this dish, which is brought to your table at the zenith of its powers, its taste, flavour, textures, temperature, at the peak of perfection, and without tasting it, you call for salt? They did. Your salt, sir. I hate you with a passion you can only dream of. Lenny Henry is chef, Thursday at 9.30 on BBC One. Bon appetit. On BBC Two now, Tim Rice and his guests are looking back at the past week's television, including Clive James, fame in the 20th century. Here on BBC One in 15 minutes, Mastermind. Now at 9.25, the news with Michael Burke. Europe's exchange rate mechanism faces a battle for survival tomorrow after this weekend's devaluation of the Irish punt. Irish politicians say the other members of the ERM threw them to the wolves. British Cole says the pits that failed the closure review will be put up for sale. And British engineers say the Croatian dam could collapse at any time. Good evening. Europe's currencies are likely to come under more pressure on the money markets tomorrow after Ireland was forced to devalue its currency, the punt, by 10%. Ireland's finance minister, Bertie Ahern, blamed the other members of the European exchange rate mechanism. He asked for support, he said, and he didn't get it. City experts say the pound could come under pressure too, even though Britain was forced to leave the ERM last September. The devaluation was not unexpected, as it had followed intense speculation on the punt in the preceding days. But the inevitable post-mortem has followed along similar lines as Britain's, even though Ireland remains in the ERM. Ministers say a review of the mechanism must be speeded up and complain of lack of support from other member countries. The grave disappointment I have, not alone did we not e get equal treatment uh, with all of the other countries that were under pressure, uh, we got inferior treatment because the French franc uh, got the sweetheart deal or bilateralism as they like to call it in Germany. At the Birmingham summit soon after Britain's devaluation, reform of the ERM was put on the agenda by John Major, but there was little enthusiasm from other members at the time. Now some senior Conservatives consider the mechanism to be beyond change. Well, the departure of the punt is the latest symptom of the breakup of the ERM, which started with uh, Golden Wednesday and Sterling's exit from the system. And clearly, I mean, if, for example, the Frank were to have to follow suit, that would be the end of the DeLorean delusion that economic convergence can be brought about by fixing exchange rates. Opponents of the Maastricht Treaty see the latest disarray in the ERM as further proof that the treaty is unworkable, but accept the government will press ahead. This ought to help our case, but I'm afraid we're in the hands of ideologues who are determined to secure a treaty. After all, we've been through this before in the direct and personal sense of, of the British economy and what it had done to us. Labour sources today reaffirm their support for a system of managed exchange rates. But even they acknowledge the ERM was now in such a mess, its future was in doubt. The next test for the ERM could be if the franc comes under renewed pressure when the markets reopen in a few hours. Even previous ERM enthusiasts accept that the mechanism would then be close to collapse. And so the Maastricht Treaty continues its weary passage through Parliament here this week with one of its principal goals, monetary union, being called into question once more. Even one strongly pro-Maastricht minister said today that the timetable for union envisaged by some member countries had become quite unrealistic. Lord Owen has said he believes that a settlement in Bosnia is very close, even though there was no agreement at the Geneva Peace Conference. Speaking in London, Lord Owen said he was optimistic that the warring factions would go to New York this week for further talks. Uh, Cyrus Vance and I always said that when it came to a point where we thought that negotiations were really being dragged out, that we wouldn't be party to it and we'd bring matters to a head and take them to New York and to put our case to the Security Council. That is exactly what we do we're doing. We would have liked them all to sign up on Saturday. We didn't think they would. They signed up for the defence agreement. That's very good news. Now let's get that map settled in the next uh, week to ten days. British engineers sent to Croatia to help with emergency work on the Perugia Dam have been inspecting new signs that it might collapse. 
The Croats, who say it was sabotaged by Serbs, are continuing to evacuate the area below the dam. The British engineers started assessing the dam at first light. The good news was that the water level in the reservoir had fallen, reducing the pressure on the dam. The bad news was that a new hole 15 feet deep had opened up. This morning at 7 o'clock, this, this was not here. And no. now it's here. And now it is. While the hole was being filled, another appeared. They're caused by water running through the dam, which is eroding its clay core. The latest deterioration in the dam shows just how close the Serbs came to destroying it. The people in the valley below aren't out of danger yet, though. The reservoir is still almost full. When half of it has been drained, the danger will be much reduced. The engineers say that will take two weeks. Until then, the dam must be monitored constantly. This is not to scale, I hate to say. This evening they said things were getting better, but there's a real threat. It's a process the engineers called runaway. It happens when there's been so much erosion that water starts flowing faster and faster right through the dam. It's a sign that it's about to collapse. You would have, um, and this is an absolute sort of off the top of one's head, because it does depend entirely by what mechanism these things are happening, but you'd probably have, um, oh, perhaps uh, nine to ten hours. Croatian soldiers at the Perucha Dam have already evacuated 3,000 people from the area. At least there's a local ceasefire. That isn't the case an hour's drive away. Around 120 Croatians crossed the front line from the Serb enclave of Krajina this morning. They said that every Croatian man aged from 16 to 70 was being sent call-up papers by the Serb army. They said that Serb militiamen had been arriving from Belgrade ever since the Croatian offensive started 10 days ago, and they were telling Croats to get out or get killed. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, Southern Croatia. Here, the chairman of British Coal, Neil Clark, has said that any pits which fail to survive the current review of the industry will be offered to the private sector. He says anyone interested in buying will be invited to tender. The NUM president, Arthur Scargill, continued his campaign against pit closures today with a rally at the threatened Cotgrave Colliery in Nottinghamshire. He believes Friday's select committee report on coal lets the government off too easily. Unless they are persuaded that they've got it wrong, not only in terms of Cotgrave, but energy policy in general, and that all 31 pits should remain open, I will not be satisfied. A lifeline for some of the pits which don't get rescued by the Select Committee report has emerged tonight. British Coal now says it'll offer the private sector a chance to bid for any pit still facing closure at the end of the current review. Mines, if they're going to be closed and people wish to operate them, as far as I'm concerned, will be offered for sale to those who wish to operate them. Betis Colliery in Dovid is one of those which could be sold. The mining company Ryan International is planning to bid. It says British coal is underestimating the market for the high-quality anthracite coal that's mined here. We have great anthracite reserves in South Wales. The German anthracite industry is collapsing. It's hugely subsidised. And I would expect the South Wales anthracite to be marketed throughout Europe. But even if private firms do buy some pits, they may seek redundancies to make them profitable. Iraq has hinted that it may be prepared to review the cases of two Britons jailed in Baghdad if Iraq's assets here are unfrozen. Michael Wainwright from West Yorkshire is serving 10 years for allegedly entering Iraq illegally. He's sharing a cell with Paul Ride from North London, who was jailed for seven years after being accused of the same offence. The hint of a review came from Iraq's Deputy Prime Minister in a BBC interview. If the British government shows sympathy towards the hardship of, of the Iraqi people, then, of course, it would be very natural that the Iraqi government would show sympathy to, to the difficulties of two or three British uh, citizens. Hundreds of foreigners, including a number of Britons, are leaving Zaire to escape the killing and looting which followed a mutiny by some of the country's soldiers. Belgium says it'll send in troops if there are any problems with the evacuation. The refugees are crossing the Congo River from the capital, Kinshasa, to neighbouring Brazzaville. Ferry boats laden with people, pets and luggage offloaded their passengers after the short river crossing from Kinshasa to the safety of Brazzaville. 
the boats returned almost empty, except for a few Zairians going home, a handful of foreigners, and the French paratroopers organizing the latest evacuation from Zaire. We arrived in Kinshasa in time to witness the somber quayside ceremony in honor of the French ambassador to Zaire killed in Thursday's violence. The bodies of Philippe Bernard and another Frenchman draped in the blue, white and red tricolor and escorted by French soldiers in red berries were seen off by members of Kinshasa's diplomatic corps and a dwindling French community. What struck me most during the 10 minute drive from the river port into Kinshasa was the eerie silence in a city normally teeming with activity and traffic. The streets were virtually deserted with just an occasional car or a pedestrian. But there was little sign of a military presence in the hours leading up to an unofficial nighttime curfew. Ophelia Christopherson, BBC, Kinshasa. The bodies of 117 people have been recovered in Kenya after the country's worst rail crash. The accident happened yesterday between Mombasa and Nairobi when a passenger train plunged into a flooded river. When the floodwaters subsided, carriages from the train lay scattered on the surrounding mud banks, together with scores of bodies. The Mombasa to Nairobi Express had been crossing a bridge when the whole structure collapsed. Twelve coaches were left on the track, the front five and the engine plunged into the river. 600 people were on board, 200 are still unaccounted for. Wreckage was swept up to a mile downstream by the waters which had weakened the bridge. Only a few people were found alive in all of this, saved by hanging on to the upturned coaches. Two Britons were actually on board the train. They say they could do nothing to help those in the water. The disaster happening in a matter of seconds. We felt a jolt, train come to a halt, and our relations who were in the first class cabin up, way up in front, and they rushed towards us to check if we were okay. And I said, we heard screams, people asking for help, and then sudden silence after a few minutes, and we could watch but couldn't do nothing. Today, it's been less of a search for survivors, more a case of retrieving bodies. Some are believed to be tourists. Those who did escape, some dazed, some overwrought, were taken to emergency centers nearby. As government officials arrived on the scene, there's already anger in Kenya that this bridge, built in 1898, had received little maintenance. The recriminations, though, are taking second place to the continued operation here. The authorities say it will be two days before the exact death toll is known. Football and Liverpool's troubled season received a boost this afternoon when they beat Arsenal 1-0 at Highbury. Liverpool scored the only goal of the game after Ian Rush was brought down in the penalty area. John Barnes scored convincingly. Arsenal, who had Nigel Winterburn sent off, were awarded a penalty of their own, but a fine save from David James gave Liverpool the points. England's cricketers are fighting to avoid defeat in the first test in Calcutta. They were forced to follow on by India and ended the third day on 128 for two. When Neil Fairbrother, England's last specialist batsman, went in the second over of the day, hopes of a sustained first innings recovery went with him, although the unflappable Ian Salisbury mixed cautious defence with measured aggression to rally England's cause. He received solid support from Paul Taylor, but with England tantalisingly just nine runs away from avoiding the follow-on, Salisbury's marathon act of defiance ended in somewhat inglorious fashion. England were all out 208 runs behind, but with Stewart in particular adopting a more positive approach, their second innings began brightly. Then with the total on 50, Gooch departed in rather curious circumstances, given out stumped as he wandered from his crease. When Stewart followed, caught by Amre off the leg spinner Kumble, England were still 97 runs adrift. Mike Gatting had reduced that deficit to 80 by the close, but a draw, the best result England can realistically achieve from this match, is still a long way off. Lord Soper, the Methodist minister and soapbox orator, celebrated his 90th birthday today. A crowd of more than 200 turned up at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park to hear him preach. He's been there every week for over 50 years. I believe that taxation, in principle, should be the same for local government as it is for general government. Render unto Caesar that which I is Caesar's. Just, just be quiet. <laughs>
<laughs> With half a century of heckling, he's had plenty of practice. That's all from the newsroom this weekend. Good night. <laughs>